on the July 2024 What's Neat. We've got a great segment from George Bogatuck, whereas he's now starting to work on the track on his layout. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Lombard Hobbies, your value hobby shop for over 40 years of modelers helping modelers. Big inventory, value pricing, fast shipping, and great service. And by Broadway Limited Imports, the cutting edge leader in model trains. Check out their website at broadway-limited.com. And by Bachman Trains. Now that's the way to run a railroad. Check out their website at bachmantrains.com. And thank you for helping us support the best hobby in the world. This is What's Neat for July 2024. I'm your host, Ken Patterson. And this month, we've got a great segment from George Bogatuck, whereas he's now starting to work on the track on his layout. And he does something I've never actually done before, but it's a great idea this month in that he's making his track look like secondary track. And it's quite a simple process what he went through this month to do just that. Also this month, Tyler Haney from Bachman Industries comes in and he talks to us about all the latest products that uh, Bachman Industries has got for this month of July. It's a pretty neat interview with Tyler. I really love that gentleman's personality. Also this month, we start a new segment on what's neat and it's kind of interesting in that it's going to be short. One, two, or three minute short segments on model railroad tips, model building tips, tricks, things like that. And I did my first segment this month for this video. Now, I want to tell you to be sure to check out the What's Neat This Week video podcast that we shoot down here every Saturday night, keeping you updated on what's new in the hobby with our podcast crew, a lot of great special guests, and a lot of wonderful products of which you can review by going to whatsneat.com, which is an index for that show. Now, this month, I've got this beautiful S1 locomotive on my computer screen, and that's because Broadway Limited as in Imports has announced this amazing model. This is one of Pensy's four experimental models, steam locomotives that they made over the years. This one was a streamline version. It was a 6226 locomotive. Very long, very streamlined. Broadway Limited is making this beautiful model in four variations, the Pennsylvania Railroad paint scheme, the World's Fair paint scheme, and a Tuscan red fantasy scheme, and they're going to also make this in an unlettered version. Uh, the original locomotive lasted for about 10 years on the Pennsylvania Railroad. It was scrapped in 1949, but prior to that, its first two years it spent touring the railroad and showing off all of its beautiful lines in what they called the New York World's Fair, where they actually had the locomotive sitting on ball bearings and running for the audience stationary. It sounds absolutely fantastic and interesting to me. This model is a brass model. The boiler is bent out of brass with a lot of beautiful details applied. Paragon Force sound. Um, just all of the bells and whistles that you would expect on this beautiful engine. So be sure to check them out at Broadway Limited uh, Imports website. And with that, let's continue on with the rest of this July 2024 What's Neat.
Hey guys, George from Soundtracks here. And on this particular episode or segment of What's Neat, I'm gonna show you how I do some track laying. Um, as some of you know, I'm working on a new section of the layout and you can kind of see this right here. And I've got to finish laying this little section here with a turnout to two industrial sidings. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you some track laying tips that I have to help hopefully make your model railroads a little bit better. So first off, what I'm gonna do is I'm just showing you right now, I've just gotta put in this little segment so I can space out the turnouts. Now, when it comes to my track, I get asked a few different things. And of course, what brand track do you use and or do you use brand track do you lay your own? Um, and then there's also, when people see it, they're always amazed at how it looks. And personally, I just kind of think it's easy and it doesn't warrant anything special, but because of that, I figured I'd share my techniques with you. So first thing is, is I'm using only microengineering flex track. Um, in my opinion, it is the best, most detailed uh, HO scale flex track that you can find. Um, it's a little bit of a bear in some cases to work with as it is, you can't just sit there and bend it as you go. You kind of have to work it and get the, the uh, correct curvature and everything in there. But to me, the detail on the tie plates, the spikes, um, every, everything just looks better in my opinion. Um, and remember, track is a model too, even though it's what we run our trains on, it is still considered a, uh, a model. Um, and then on my turnouts, um, I get asked a lot, of course, uh, what type of turnouts do you use? And microengineering makes some really great turnouts, but my limitation is they only make a number six. Um, and so I started looking around to see what else was out there. And I came across these Pico turnouts, P-E-C-O. These are the folks from the UK. And in my opinion, these are, are great turnouts. Um, they, they don't have exactly all the details that our microengineering turnouts have, but as far as reliability, operation, and appearance overall, I'm more than happy to save a little bit of those details so I can get different radiuses. And so right here, um, I've got some number eights, uh, which I usually use on my main line. Um, I've got some number seven curve sections. And as you can see, I have two of them because I uh, might as well save them up and just some different ones here that we're trying to match. Um, but one of the things I really like about the turnouts, and this is a brand new turnout that I have here. This is a code 70 um, number six. But one of the things you'll notice here on this turnout is they have a hinge that's right there. And so the points become stamped metal and you can really notice that um, the fact that the metal is kind of bent over on itself and then as it comes to a point it eventually stops and you just have a single blade sticking out um, but they've really vastly improved here um, as you can see on this one this is a number six in their um, code 70 line and this is uh, a solid closure rail all the way through there's no hinge you can tell it's machined and in my opinion it's far superior and as it turns you see that proper prototypical movement of the uh, points. And so in my opinion, this is why I've started, I've used these. Now, the Pico uh, I've been using on my layout now, but uh, they just started doing these not too long ago. And so uh, be sure to take a look at this um, as one of the options. Um, the other thing is they have what they're calling their unifro unifrog. And the unifrog can be a dead frog or you can power it. And on the back side, they have this little wire that you can pull out. Whoops, there it is. And that allows you to power the uh, turnout. You run that through your ground or through your sub road bed and attach a wire to it. And so one of the things when I'm laying track is I always wanna make sure every frog is powered. And the reason for that is because that way the locomotives are less likely to encounter any dead spots. If we have power on every piece of rail, that way we can make sure that we have continuity, whether we're using DCC, um, DC, or even wireless Bluetooth with track power. Um, that way your decoders are less likely to lose power because when your decoder loses power, it's a processor. So it has to shut down and then wake back up in the new environment. And that's where 
uh, track power becomes uh, ultimately a key. Um, but getting back to track, I just wanted to kind of cover that a little bit. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to take some uh, micro engineering uh, code 70 unweathered flex and I'm going to show you how I take it and run it on the layout. Now on the layout here, and I'll show you this with the camera, um, as I mentioned, we have a section here before I get to the turnout and so I'm putting in a small little jumper rail uh, piece to make sure that it matches up so everything's aligned properly. Um, now, in the industrial areas, the railroads are going to save a little bit of money and they don't necessarily need ties as often or as close together um, because you're usually running at slower speeds, um, usually not using a heavy train, things like that. Uh, and so the railroads would save money a little bit by not using quite as many ties or, or as people know across the pond as sleepers. Um, and so when we look at our traditional microengineering track, this is typically what you would see on a main line, um, really close spaced, close ties, um, and they look great. And like I said, the detail on the track is, is, is very, very good. But you can see in, in this section of track, you can see how the ties are more spaced apart, trying to represent a little bit more of the, um, of the industrial spur and so that's what that's the look we're trying to go for and so i'm going to show you how to do this um, now this cutout right here you're seeing on these ties is so that it mates with the turnouts because when you come into a turnout here you can kind of see how lining up how those ties might interfere so you cut off the edge of the first couple of ties so that that way you don't have any interference and i usually do that on the diverging route um, because then that way um, there's no interference on the straight route or the tangent, however you want to call it. So now to do this, uh, this is actually pretty easy. Now on the underside, and I'm going to show you using this piece here, and hopefully it comes through well enough on the camera. You can kind of see here where there's a piece of plastic here and then a piece of plastic here and then one here and then one here. And you kind of see how it alternates and that's how they uh, shoot these ties all as one casting, but then allow it flexibility. Is so you've got that on every other one. Now on this other section here, you can kind of see, other than this first section right here, there are no sleep, there are no little joints in between. And the reason for that is because I've cut them out. And the reason is is because on this particular piece, I use I removed every fifth tie, um, so there was four ties, and then. I remove one and then count four ties and remove one so I could space it out. Now this first tie on most microengineering doesn't have any uh, spike plates on it. So if you cut that, it's just gonna fall off. So I left that on just to help uh, maintain everything. But, and then when, once you do this, and I'm gonna show you this in real time, once you cut this, then you can space the ties out and just take care, do it slow. So I'm gonna put this piece here on the layout. I'm gonna install the turnout next to it and then we're gonna cut this piece of flex track and we're gonna show you how to do that. So I'll be right back. Okay, so now we've got our turnout laid and now we're gonna take our track. Now, I originally shot this part and apparently the camera didn't record it or whatever. So I'm just showing you the example of what I did. Um, but I'm using a short piece of track instead of the three foot section because underneath the camera right now, those pieces of track are laid. When I went to edit, I found the clip missing. So anyway, what we're gonna do is I wanna show you how to do this so that you can spread those ties out. Now, as we've mentioned, you can see on the underside of these tracks where every other opposite side, you can see the, pla bla or the uh, brown plastic piece that holds the ties together. Now they alternate back and forth because that's what allows the, the tie casting in plastic to flex to match whatever uh, contour you wanna do. But remember, we're not doing a full main line which has the ties really close together. We're gonna to do this in such a way so it's an industrial siding. And so the way I'm gonna do this is I'm just gonna go on the underside of this piece of track and then we're just gonna go ahead and cut those pieces out. So we're just gonna go ahead and cut the little brown plastic pieces out. So you can see on this first one, I just removed it. And so there's not one on either side. 
and I'm just gonna work my way down. And the reason I'm gonna do this is because this is gonna allow me to move the ties freely on the section of rail and not necessarily have to uh, be adherent to the fact that the ties have to be closer together. And if they did still have these little brown plastic pieces, if you go to stretch it, then the ties start doing this because they're bound together. Um, now, in this particular section of track, what I wanna do is I wanna remove about every fifth tie. And the reason for that is because then you can space it out. Now, depending on the uh, look you're wanting to go for, you can remove every fifth tie. Um, on this section of layout here, and I'm gonna get the camera. On this section of track here, this is the what's considered the main. I removed every eighth tie. And so you can see the ties are a lot closer together than say they are here on this section of track. Um, and that's because on this section, I removed every fifth tie. On this one, I removed every eighth tie. And so you can kind of see the difference. And then here's the finished section and we're gonna show you how to do this. And you can see how the ties are spaced out quite a bit more, but the good news is the gauge is there. So like I said, we're just gonna work our way through and just remove these little brown bridges. Now, to remove the tie, this is gonna be a critical part where you're gonna to wanna to make sure to take your time. You're gonna count your ties, one, two, three, four. So this is tie number five. When you're removing this tie, in order to prevent the track from flexing or pulling more than one tie up, of course, you have to make sure that you have those brown spacers cut out. But what I do is I set it on a surface. I grab and put my finger on the two ties that I want to stay. And then I take my thumb and just gently lift the tie that I want out. And so you get that gap and you can kind of see that there. So we're gonna continue working our way down the line. So one, one, two, three, four, and then that's tie number five. So again, to make sure you see this, we're gonna one, two, three, four, five. We wanna make sure to hold these ties down and then just lift the one up. By holding the track to the surface, you're preventing that flex and so just the tie uh, plates and the spikes are actually what's being pulled up. Um, and then you can work your way down the track again. So really doesn't take very long, but it is a little bit time consuming and you end up with all these little brown plastic spacers all over the place. So again, one, two, three, four, and then this would be tie number five. So I need to finish cutting this one because I didn't cut it free and now it's free. So you can see how quickly that work, that goes. So now I'm gonna go back to the content that I actually shot during the track laying process that turned out good, but now you have the process so you'll see what we're talking about during that, uh, the rest of the explanation. So we'll be back. or not. Okay guys, another tip that I wanted to share with you is while we're sitting here cutting these uh, little spacers out, I um, wanted to remind you of a couple of things. Number one is when you're doing this, you wanna make sure you're doing it on a hard surface uh, because you don't want to get in there trying to make a cut and then have the, uh, wherever you're working, whether it's, you know, don't do this on this foam because it's flexible or you could cut into the foam or push down into the foam um, because then you're not gonna get as clean of a cut. And then number two, make sure you use a sharp blade on your knife because that way it makes quick work of it. Um, so a hard surface and a um, 
sharp blade really help make this go fast. But the other thing remember is that this is the underside of the track. So if you miss it and it's not perfect, who cares? You're about to bury it in ballast anyway. Nobody's ever gonna see it. Um, so all we're doing is we're just removing these so we can re-space re these out. One, two, three, four. That means this guy gets cut there and there and we remove. And as you can see here, I'm starting to get a little bit of a pile of ties and looking at the track, you can see how I've got all these different ties missing. You see four ties and then a space. So I'm gonna keep working on this and I'll be back in just a moment and then we'll space out the ties um, because that's the finished product. That's what we're working on. So guys, I'll be right back. Okay guys, I'm all done with this section of track and I did cut it short to fit the space that I'm actually going to be putting it in. So I didn't need to do all three foot of flex track, just most of it. That's all that's left of the regular section. So you can see I didn't change that up much. But now with our every four ties, now we just take a little bit of time and space them out. Now this is where you wanna take a little bit of time um, because you don't really want to pull out the ties off of the rail, but you can kind of move them around. Now that they're free, you can kind of move them a little bit. And so you wanna move them out to fill the gap from the front and the back of the gap. And you'll just do this very slowly and the ties start to move. And once you get going, you can kind of see here that first section, how I filled the space. So let me see if I can move the camera to be a little bit better oriented. Let's see if we can do it this way so you can kind of see what I'm doing. Let's see, I'm trying not to be top heavy, bear with me. And this might work. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm just taking this first tie and just kind of wiggling it and moving it down the track a little bit. You can kind of see it's slightly moving and then we'll take the one behind it and just slightly move it into the gap. Now, because you have ties on both sides of the gap, you wanna kind of fill that in and you can be uneven, it doesn't matter. Um, you can go in and just kind of play with it and eyeball it and they're gonna be all over the place because again, this is an industrial track. So it's not gonna quite get the care that you would see in a regular mainline track. And so we're just taking our time and these ties are actually pretty good to move on the rail, so you don't have to worry too much about them popping off. Um, but if you do, like I said, so what? It's a, a branch line, it won't really matter, and you can easily replace it, or you can even uh, leave it out and, and space them out a little bit further. So you can kind of see how the ties are spaced more here versus over here where they're still connected or close together because I haven't moved them yet. You can kind of see how that's taking place. And we're gonna do the same thing. We're just gonna kind of work our way down the rail, moving these ties a little bit each way. And that kind of gives us the, more of the light industrial, you know, not a heavy mainline section of track. And we can just sit there and move our ties around and like I said, you can adjust these to your heart's content. The good news is once you get a feel for how easy these ties will slide down the rail, it kind of gives you more of that look of a uh, hand laid track because the ties are more spaced out rather than being right on top of each other. And honestly, irregular spacing is kind of not necessarily a bad thing because you can get where maybe they've replaced some ties over the years, uh, maybe some wear and tear on the rail, um, you know, and it gives you, it gives your, rat, your track a little bit more uh, character because everything's not necessarily as even. You can even, once this is done, you can even make some of them at a slight angle like this. Um, so that way it really gives that hard industrial looks. So you can kind of see how they're not even necessarily all square. Um, now this section of track that I'm laying is actually gonna have a slight curve to it still. So I'm just trying to space the ties out a little bit to kind of, you know, evenly make sure everything's where it needs to go. And then I'll uh, put the curve into it and I'll show you how I do that. Um, you definitely wanna have some track laying gauges, uh, curves, 
ones. The one I have here in front of me is called by Track Seta. Um, there was another one here by a company called Ribbon Rail. I have no idea if these guys are even still around, either one of these. Um, but these are some ones I picked up at the uh, hobby shop and I've collected them over the years in various radiuses. Um, on my layout, minimum is 36. So I'm going to make sure I continue with that 36 inch radius uh, curve minimum on my layout, even in the industrial area, because again, guys, consistency pays off. So, all right, now I think that looks pretty good. So you can kind of see how the ties are spaced and now they look a lot more like a light industrial uh, track section. So we're gonna move the camera a little bit over here and kind of see now, this particular piece of track is gonna come down here. This is gonna to go to my oil dealer. And I've got my road bed glued to the uh, foam using wood glue. And then once it was glued and dried in place, I came over it with a uh, shore form tool. And that's one of those uh, tools, a woodworking tool you can get at the hardware store. And it just kind of helps take the edge off, make sure you have a smooth surface, especially between joints of pieces of, of cork things can get a little uneven. Um, also, you'll note I'm using N-scale cork, and the reason for that is because these are industrial lines. Uh, they're not necessarily, you know, full-fledged, uh, well-maintained main lines, so I'm not gonna worry too much about having the perfect uh, ballast uh, uh, profile on the side of the track, because these are, in, you know, this is just industrial, so we're just gonna do this a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with a little bit of a bend here. Um, try to fit it into place. And what I'm gonna do is one of the things I also like about this microengineering track is it holds its shape. So if I start bending it into shape, then I don't have to worry about it too much. But I'm gonna take my gauge and I'm gonna put it here in between the rails. And this will help make sure that I conform to the 36 inch radius rail that I want. Um, and it'll make sure that my uh, uh, curve is where I want it. So when I'm actually putting this in place, now you can kind of see how this is lining up. So I've got a slight curve here as I go into the track. Now my rails are uneven here at the front, so we'll uh, cut that and make it even to go into the turnout. But I'm just testing fit to make sure everything looks good. So as you can see, we're pretty much right down the middle. And this being a industrial lead, it doesn't need to be absolutely perfectly straight because over time, lack of maintenance, uh, things like that, your track is actually gonna get a little bit wobbly. Um, and so therefore, uh, it doesn't need to be perfect on the industrial area, just meth to make sure your trains run down the track. So, all right, with this, we're going to take our marker. We're gonna mark where we need to cut our rail to make sure they match up. And I believe that's where I want to cut it. Okay. So we're just going to take a marker. Now I'm going to get these Zuron rail nippers and we're going to use the flat side on the part of the rail that we want to use and preserve because the inside, if I use this inside here, it pinches the rail and kind of really doesn't give us a good edge and it's going to take a lot of work to get it straight. But when we use the flat side of this, it actually works really well to give us a good flush cut. So we're gonna line it up. We're gonna make sure we're as vertical as we possibly can. And we're just gonna simply cut and nip the rail. We're gonna throw that in the trash. And then we're gonna inspect it. And it looks like it needs just a little bit of filing. So you always have a small little file here and make sure you're handy. And we're just gonna make sure that these rail joiners slide on nice and easy, just by filing away any burr that was created from the cut. And just like that, all right so now let's move you around over here let's see if you can see yeah, you can kind of see it um, now i'm just going to slide the rail joiners in to place that one goes in and the other one is going in as well or started to yeah, the other side's got a little bit of a... Let's make sure this is flush too. Like I said, the little bit of work on your rail to make sure everything goes in flush and works really, really well 
um, is paid off in dividends when you're operating and running your trains because you don't have any issues. So I'm going to, let's see here, there we go. Now we're in. All right, we are lined up. Now we're gonna take just a screwdriver and make sure that our rail joiners are even on both pieces of rail. Oops, slid off of that one, but that's okay. Didn't damage anything, and there we go. All right, now we've got our track set a gauge in here, or our, our ribbon rails one, the track set is in front of me. And we're gonna place our tie, and you kind of see now how that fits in here. Now I've got my 36 inch radius, and then now I can come in here and just kind of make sure everything looks good. And now we've got our track in place and you can kind of see now how the ties look a lot lighter than what they did. Now here's the before and after comparison. So you can kind of see now uh, the difference. And you know, you can certainly tell that that's an industrial section of track. Now, what I'm gonna do from here on out, uh, I'm going to do this other leg, leg of the turnout. I'm gonna come off of here and go into here. Now, I painted this just so I knew where everything was gonna go. This is gonna be a, a concrete embedded team track. So I'm only gonna cut the ties to about here because this rail is gonna be embedded in the concrete anyway. So it does not matter whether the ties are in there or not. So this way it'll save a little bit of work and I can just cut the ties here to match the ones here. Um, obviously it's gonna be a lot harder to remove ties on these turnouts, so I'm not even gonna try, but you get the idea on how to do it on the rest of the track. Um, now to finish up, I'm going to uh, solder all the rail joints and then I'm gonna glue everything in place. Um, I'm gonna take some construction adhesive, I'm gonna sp spread it on the, uh, on the uh, roadbed very thin and then I'm just gonna take some uh, T-pins. Uh, I got these little brown plastic things in all over the place here. Uh, but anyway, I'm just gonna take some T-pins some uh, tea pins and press them through the, the foam to help glue and hold the, road, uh, the track in place while the glue dries. And then once the glue's dried, I'll drill my holes and put my feeder wires down in there and attach it into the bus wire. So. Um, that's pretty much everything here, track laying uh, 101 with George. And hopefully this has been helpful for you guys. So guys, thanks for watching. And that's this segment of What's Neat. Okay guys, one last tip here. I'm actually getting ready to put my track down and I'm using this Gorilla Glue heavy duty construction adhesive, uh, good for all, perp all surfaces. But what we want to do is we want to make sure that it says plastic over here. Now, the brand isn't necessarily important, but you just get yourself a caulking gun. And I'm going to put the camera down here so you can kind of see what I'm doing. Um, just putting a little bit of glue on the roadbed here where I'm going to put the track. And it doesn't need to be a lot because remember, we're going to come back in and ballast this. So we're just, just trying to tack this down and glue it in uh, so that that way we have uh, enough to hold the track down in place and everything lines up where we want to. And that looks good right there. That's all that's needed. Now I'm gonna grab the camera and show you guys what it looks like. And you can kind of see uh, here I skipped because this is where our throw bar is. So we wanna make sure we skip that part. And then we're just gonna take his flat putty knife and just kind of smooth it out a little bit, make us a flat surface of where we wanna uh, put our track. And this is exactly what we're doing, just like that. We're just gonna make a nice surface. Now it'll build up a little bit on the knife so we can come back here and put a little more. Um, it's a whole lot easier to add more than it is to take it away. So I think we're actually gonna add a little bit more over here. So I'll put the camera down for a moment. Come over here. Like I said, we're just tacking it so it doesn't necessarily need to be a ton of glue, but we want to make sure it's enough to hold the track because this the glue is going to embed around the ties and that should be good. Now let's go down this one and you can this one here looks about the same. So I'm going to add just a little bit more 
because again, it's a whole lot easier to add more than it is to take it away. Okay. Now we're gonna put it through here. This is where our turnout's gonna go. And there we go. So track is, or glue is down. So now we have nice smooth surface to which to glue the track. Now I have my track assembly. Now I've already soldered the rails together. So this is one a giant assembly. And so I'm gonna pull my frog wire and flatten it out. And you see I'm putting my hand under here to support it until I line everything up where it's supposed to go. And behind the camera, I'm actually lining up to the part of the track that's already glued in place. Um, and so I'm putting these rail joiners on so that everything lines up properly and rail joiners are in. Now I'm gently just gonna set these pieces of track down into the glue. And we can adjust and tweak all this uh, till we get the look we're looking for. And so, just like that. Now, in this case, I still have my track uh, gauge for the radius curve here, because this is the tighter curve. This one's a longer curve, so I'm not real worried about it. It's a slight curve. But you can see everything's in there lined up. You can see the arrows uh, lined up where the throw bar is. So that's all sitting here perfectly lined up. We're gonna check our joints here because these were the joints I was putting together. I'm sorry, these are the joints I was just putting together, lining up where they're gonna go. Now I'm just gonna take my T-pins and we're gonna put them through and we're just gonna hold the track in place. And you can go down in the middle of the ties because um, again, we're just tacking it in place. The glue's gonna do the work. This is just making sure that we don't get any bows um, or anything come up or anything like that. So we're just simply putting our track in place. And this is also where you'd kind of go through and you want to make sure any alignments um, or curvatures. So in this case, this is the team track and it's going to be embedded in concrete, but we can come along here and make sure everything looks straight because once it's embedded in the concrete, it ain't going anywhere. And once the uh, glue dries, we don't have much of an ability other than tearing it up to realign it. So you wanna make sure that everything looks good, linear, down the track line. Now, I wanted to show you over here, I had a couple of these ties break off. So since this is all gonna be embedded in the concrete, it doesn't matter. So I just moved the ties around to fit so that it's enough to keep the gauge, but not so much that I have to worry about scrapping it or using a new piece of track. And again, these ties can be moved around as needed. And that's why these are all close together versus these other ones, which are farly, are, are spaced farther apart. So this track's starting to move a little bit. So let's get some pins in it. And we are literally just sticking the pins in to hold it into place. And there we go. I kind of like the way that's looking and the track alignment looks pretty good. Uh, this way, but remember, this is a branch line. This is an industrial lead, so it doesn't necessarily need to be perfect. So we've got our turnout in place. I'm gonna put one more here, kind of in between these two rails right there. And we'll go ahead and put one more right in here as well. We wanna make sure that, um, oops. Oh, I'm hitting a cross member there. So let's see, I can go over here. There we go. And we're just trying to make sure everything stays down. So now we got that and we've got a little curvature right there. So everything's looking good. Um, let's put one over here just to kind of help hold that in place. And we're golden. So this is it, this is easy to do. Um, now we're gonna let our glue dry and then we'll drop our feeders and then we're gonna come in and start weathering the track and get it ready for painting. But that's gonna be another segment of what's neat. So guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Here's a quick modeling tip. When you're spraying your ballast or your ground foam on your layout, and you're either using a watered down solution of white glue and water with a little bit of soap as a wetting agent, 
or you're using what I like to use with the Woodland Scenics, Scenic Cement. Make sure that when you apply this to your layout that you use a high quality spray bottle. And what do I mean by that? You could use a Windex bottle or some of the from the store bottles that come with the solution in them when they're empty, use them. But make sure that the sprayer tip is adjustable so that you can have a fine mist. Because what you don't want is a type of a spray and then no matter how much I adjust this one, I cannot get a fine mist out of it. Which you do need when you're applying the glue to your ballast and your shoulder line. Because if you get larger droplets of water, they're going to hit the ballast like small little bombs, little bitty cannonballs. And they're gonna ruin the aesthetics of what you just spent a lot of time with a brush, smoothing and making just perfect the way you want it. So make sure that when you're using the Woodland Scenic Scenic Cement, here's a better quality bottle. I picked this one up at the Home Depot. And this one does spray a very fine mist and it's adjustable. See that? So when you're spraying like this, it's just a mist of water and glue settling down on your scenery. One additional tip I do want to bring up, and this has always been an issue, if you don't shake up your Woodland Scenic Scenic Cement, or if your white glue mixture gets a little bit lumpy, which it tends to do, if you don't shake this up right, the lumps in it, they will still remain in the material. You've got to really, you know, shake this up. And what happens is it'll end up clogging this part of the sprayer nozzle, a little screen down there. And it's really simple. You just blow it out or run water through it, check it often. In fact, these things do get clogged up pretty quick, the white stuff, and that'll cause the sprayer to not mist. And then it'll start putting water droplet bombs onto your uh, scenery. So just a quick modeler's tip for what's neat. For this segment of July 2024's What's Neat, I've got Tyler Haney on the screen here from Bachman Industries in beautiful Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I always started out that way, Tyler, because I've been there. You live in such a beautiful city. Absolutely. Thanks, Ken. And it is a beautiful day out. You know, we're uh, out of the, uh, you know, the, the doldrums of the winter, the, uh, you know, the ups and downs of rainy weather of spring, and we're just about getting into summer now, and I'm, you know, it's really beautiful out there today, and we've got some beautiful uh, Bachman products to show off as well. Wow, here we go. Show us what you've got. We love this part. Yeah, sure thing. We're going to, uh, this is going to be a mainly uh, HO sh uh, show today, but we do have some N-Scale stuff to start us off with, and this is our GP38-2. This is a new release, and these are DCC ready, which is the first time we've offered these GP38s uh, as DCC ready. Not only that, these are the first N-Scale locomotive that we're offering that have uh, Next 18 as the uh, plug. So any uh, 18 pin decoder will, that follows the Next 18 standard will plug right in there. And here's the first of the row names and my personal favorite out of the bunch, which is the Chessy system. It's beautiful. Just a very colorful, beautiful locomotive top to bottom. Wow. Are you offering those in various road numbers? Just one road number for each of these, but we do have uh, four ro different road names covering, you know, all across the country. Okay. Uh, up next, we have the uh, Milwaukee Road. Oh, that's nice, too. Uh, you'll notice that this one is without the uh, dynamic brake fans on top of the roof, so you get a little bit more of a, uh, you know, uh, sleek, simpler look to it. Uh, as the Milwaukee Road, you know, was in, uh, in the Midwest with more flat territory, they did not need the dynamic brakes. So this is the... Uh, Second road name we've offered in this configuration for this particular model. Got the uh, tried and true, the Norfolk Southern Thoroughbred. Yes. Covers a lot of your country from the east to the Midwest and the south. And finally, we have the uh, BNSF Heritage Free, another very, you know, sleek modern paint scheme. So we're very happy with how these turned out. Uh, Again, these are DCC ready. Uh, this is the second release. The first release was uh, DCC sound value on board uh, with uh, economy. And you may still be able to find those uh, at your local retailer. So make sure to check with them if that's something you're interested in. They're nice. I've got two of them in Union Pacific. 
uh, that Doug had sent for that project end scale layout over there that is going on two years of not getting finished. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Well, you know, Model Railroad's never finished, so. <laughs> Thank sure you. Did you hear that? I mean, my podcast crew needs to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, on that note, uh, I actually have some more GB38 uh, 2s here to show off. Uh, these are in N uh, HO scale rather than in N scale. Uh, the N scale ones will be coming uh, down the pike later this year. Uh, these are shipping now, and we've got two new road names for HO scale. Okay. These are also uh, DCC ready with a 21 pin decoder and uh, a decoder plug. And here we have the Amtrak Phase 5. Yes. For something, you know, for your Amtrak fans out there, uh, something a little bit different from your typical, you know, uh, the charger locomotives and, you know, passenger service equipment that we've offered. Uh, these are used in switching and MOW service. Yes. I believe this particular road number, the 726, is based out of Washington, D.C. Wow. So that's prototype. That's perfect. Yes. And that, typical. Yes. Uh, all officially licensed and approved by Amtrak. Uh, Matt Donnelly at Amtrak was a great help to us in getting some detail shots of all these uh, wedding labels along the side of the locomotive, which really, I think, adds the detail. It's a sharp looking locomotive. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. The stuff that you guys have come out with for Amtrak since the beginning of the year is amazing. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, there, there'll be more to come for sure. Uh, as far as the GP38, the other road name, and I, you know, I wanted to, I'm sure you'll appreciate this one, Ken. This is the uh, Missouri Pacific, uh, the classic uh, Jenks Blue. Yes. Uh, without the dynamic brakes, uh, this is the first time we've offered one without dynamic brakes in HO scale. Uh, and, you know, it's a very simple, you know, uh, kind of, you know, subdued paint job, but I think that, you know, makes it look all my, all, all the cooler, you know. It's got a very distinctive shade of blue. You've got your white safety stripes on the nose and along the sides. And that red logo, it's just a really nice looking, look, looking uh, locomotive. That's going to be great running. Now, did you say that that comes DCC ready or does that have sound in it? This is DCC ready okay. uh, with the 21 pin plug. So they are ready to go for whichever uh, decoder you, you prefer. Very cool. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, Mike Buddy's going to be excited about that. And Mopac. I mean, when I was in high school, I really was into Missouri Pacific um, because it was around me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, long gone now, but you know, the, uh, the legacy lives on, uh, on your model railroad. So uh, now we're gonna move into some uh, freight cars, some HR scale freight cars that are coming soon and will be uh, shipping now. They may even be in stores already by the time you're, uh, you folks at home are uh, watching this. We showed this off on What's Neat, I believe, a couple months ago uh, as a uh, engineering sample. And now we've got the painted samples here of our all new uh, HO scale uh, GATX 4180 air slide hopper. It's okay. a mouthful. Yes. Here it is. Very distinct, you know, looking uh, covered hopper from the 1960s. For those who don't know, uh, the air slide referred to these cars had a uh, specialized lining uh, when pressurized air was. Uh, pumped into these cars, it would uh, liquidize the uh, fine uh, grain, uh, you know, particle materials inside like grains and plastics and yes. make it easier for them to flow out of the car and unload it. So we've got uh, four road names for this release and these do have two road numbers each. I'm just going to show one of them. Okay. But you will find uh, two road numbers for each in our 2024 catalog. You've got the CSX. We've got a... Uh, GATX leasing unit here. Uh, these would be leased out to all kinds of private owners and railroads temporarily. I really like the uh, contrast of the uh, gray root patches to the uh, light blue body here. It this looks is my good. personal favorite out of these. Yes. I'm yes. going to give you a uh, better close up look here of the uh, super. Uh, Super fine detail uh, for the air brake system and the uh, the hoppers underneath this car. That looks great. It's also got on the top the, the see through walkways. We're really pr proud of the level of detail on this one. Two more road names. Uh, we've got these Burlington Northerns. Another very sharp, you know, colorful looking car. All green with the white graphics. And another really uh, beautiful car that's, I think, going to stand out on your layout. This is the Union Pacific. 
uh, all silver, including silver trucks with the red lettering. Very, very distinctive. No, it's I'm not sure how sure how well it will show up on camera, but you know, holding these side by side, they're both great cars, but that, that you know, metallic silver really pops out on the Union Pacific. It does. Mm -hmm. And you know, yes. the other great thing about this uh, batch of Ronooms is we've got all eras covered. Uh, this Union Pacific car uh, dates to the uh, 1960s when these first started showing up on railroads. Uh, this is how they were delivered. And you've got all the way into the uh, 1990s with the CSX and the G8 cars. So plenty of options for these, uh, you know, really uh, beautifully detailed cars. If you're uh, if you're used to uh, you know the covered hoppers that have you know the cylindrical sides or the open platforms on the end, uh, this has a little bit of a different look to it. It's almost boxcar like, and uh, I think if you haven't had a uh, air slide before, I think you uh, you'll want to give the Bachman one a shot when it comes out later this year. They're really cool looking cars. No, that's absolutely true. I want to just stop here and say, hey, listen, guys, this is the month. This is it. From the time this video comes out, we've just got a few days for the RPM meet here in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, Collinsville, Illinois is where it's actually staged. That's a suburb of Illinois side of the river. Anyway, long story short, Matt Stern's gonna be here from Bachman Industries, and you'll mm -hmm. be able to see all these models in person just a few days. Okay. Absolutely. All of these, uh, all of these models I'm showing you here uh, and some never before seen ones, so uh, stay tuned for that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna move on to a, a couple more freight cars here. These ones that we have shown on What's Neat previously, uh, and they will are shipping uh, now. I believe they're on the water as we're filming this. By the time it's out, they're gonna be arriving at dealers. We've got the second uh, release of our HO scale coil cars. Uh, this is the angled hood style, uh, as you would see on these cars that were built in the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, Reading Railroad, you know, is my personal favorite railroad, so this was a fun one to do. Yes. Show you the uh, Baltimore and Ohio one here as well. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, these coil car uh, covers do lift off. You've got a fully detailed uh, interior there. And uh, they seem to have disappeared on me, but uh, these cars do come with uh, six steel coil loads uh, that... Uh, you can remove from the car, you can run them empty like this, you can uh, mix and match the hoods. Got a car with a lot of, you know, fun, you know, play value built in and, you know, options for customization. And then finally, another car that has a uh, removable load, and this one I have the load here, our HO scale wheel car. That's... These flat cars would have been used by the uh, railroads to transport uh, wheel sets such as these, uh, you know, between their maintenance facilities. These wheel sets are removable. Uh, there's 16 of them uh, in each car, so 16 axles with the wheels on them. Nice. I really like the Santa Fe one with the contrast between, again, the silver painted body and then you've got the natural wood deck. And these wheel sets, of course, are removable. You can run this car empty if you want. You can add uh, more wheel sets. You can replace these plastic ones that come with it with metal ones. Uh, so we give you everything you need right out of the box to start having you know fun with this car and for it to look realistic you know with the load already included and it gives you some customization options as well it certainly does yeah and i've got uh one more to show you uh another locomotive and one that's been you know highly anticipated yes. our newly uh redesigned hs scale usra 060 switcher uh the dcc sound value version uh okay. for the first time ever these have sound on board uh it's an economy uh decoder from soundtracks with uh you know awesome you know high quality uh cd quality sound they've got road name specific details like the uh headlight placement uh the style of tender and i'm going to show you some of the other styles in a moment here it's uh you know ben does ben you know Redesigned, you know, we've had an 06 on our line for a long time, but this has, you know, refined body details, all kinds of new separately applied parts. Here's what they look like in our newly redesigned packaging. You've got the uh, Union Pacific here. Okay, so, this, up to the, so the, the coder and the speaker are going to be in the tender, correct? That is correct. Okay, okay, all right, all right. Wow, okay, I see the wiring. The pre production model didn't have that, so I thought for a minute you may have yes. stuck the sound in the boiler. Yeah, now that was a pre-production model. This is a production one right here in my hands. Okay. Union Pacific, you can see it has the uh, oil burning tender instead of the cold tender I just showed you. 
It's also got a uh, headlight mounted in the center of the smoke box instead of on top. You know, a very distinctive Union Pacific uh, feature. Got the uh, Pennsylvania here, which has its own unique tender without the uh, extension to the coal bunker on top. Oh, now, there's yeah. a lot of Pensy fans out there who will uh, be looking forward to these. And I'm going to quickly show you the last two here. Uh, the Baltimore and Ohio is on the top. Okay. And the uh, Jersey Central on the bottom. So five great bird names here from around the country. Uh, you know, we think these are going to be, you know, a big hit. For those of you who have, uh, you know, love steam engines but don't have the space for a big boy or a challenger one of those big articulated this is this may be exactly what you need the 060 it absolutely and is cool in that i'll bet that's a very smooth runner and that would be perfect switching out the switch yard absolutely yeah they're they're great for just that what they were built to do that's so that's nice. all i've got you know a lot of exciting stuff happening here at uh, bachman we're going to be excited to show off more of it at the uh, St. Louis uh, prototype meet. We'll also be having some new product announcements later this year uh, in August, around the time of the NMRA convention. So uh, looking forward uh, to me and my colleagues being back here on What's Neat to show them all off. I love it. Thank you very much for keeping our viewers updated on some of the neatest stuff. I mean, I, I'm still trying to get over all the Amtrak stuff, the Siemens cars, <laughs> These Charger locomotives, I mean, you guys have really made made me the modeler happy. Thank you very much. And I'm sure that goes yeah. for everybody else out there that enjoys what it, this is. Best hobby in the Absolutely. world. Thank you, Tyler, very much um, for being here with us. And again, be sure to say hey to Matt Stern here at the RPM meet coming up. And that is this segment for What's Neat. All of the products seen on this episode of What's Neat are available from Lombard Hobbies in Lombard, Illinois, or order online at LombardHobby.com. And by Broadway Limited Imports, the cutting-edge leader in model trains. Check out their website at Broadway-Limited.com. Bachman Trains, now that's the way to run a railroad. Check out their website at BachmanTrains.com.